it's always good to know that there is some little piece of something that <laughs> sticks when, when you're teaching, and I know that you all are looking for those moments where it, where it sticks. Um, and I know also that you saw the giant flower mm -hmm. yesterday, uh, and I don't know a lot about it, but at the end, if we want to talk about that a bit, that, that would be great. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today is really the, the kind of center of my uh, focus on research and thinking about things. And I'll begin by asking you, uh, have you seen a fungus today? Mm. <laughs> Somebody has. What have you seen? Lichens. Lichens, great. You saw lichens. I had some toast that looked a little bit yeah. like it might not have... <laughs> it had a little bit of fuzz on it. So. And where, where was it? Uh, it was at my house. <laughs> in the mulch in the yard? No, it was a bread box. And I took the bread out and it was like... Oh, maybe not. Yeah. I decided to. <laughs> okay, who else? What else did you see? Anybody? Yeah? Some mold, again, in my refrigerator on some green peppers that I've been okay. planning to use. So all this, you know, we uh, go out and we look, and sometimes you look and you see what you uh, know about and what you recognize, and uh, I'll just say two things that I noticed this morning as I was leaving my house. One was the uh, mildew on flocks and some of the other things all over in my garden. Uh, disappointing, but there it is. And also, in uh, all of the lawns in my neighborhood where anybody's watered at all, there's the same little mushroom coming up. So we have a whole population of this across this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I, but I point that out just because we, we see fungi and we look at fungi and we know a little bit about them. But my point today is that, boy, we don't know a lot. And there's a lot to find out. And uh, so I use some examples here. Uh, some from my research and some from uh, thinking about the uh, kind of history of collections and how we come to know what we know. So what's the focus here? It's talking about fungi and these are these sometimes kind of mysterious things, you know, they're there one day, they're not there the next, they come and they go, they're ephemeral, or at least the part we see is ephemeral. And of course, sometimes the part we see is just a little part of the whole life cycle, that we have these networks. Uh, collecting, going out in the field and trying to uh, understand diversity from firsthand experience of looking at and finding and, uh, and studying these. And because they're elusive, uh, you know, some biologists <coughs> make a uh, lifetime of going chasing these elusive organisms. So you get to see also all parts of the world. It's really amazing. You can go and have a good reason to be out and around. And then this idea of diversity. Um, you know, what do we know about the occurrence, about the natural history? And uh, I will begin at the beginning by saying, what do we know about the number of fungi in the world? I, I put this little quote in here uh, from Nick Money's book, uh, Mr. Bloomfield's Orchard. Any of you know that book? It's kind of interesting reading, and you may find it interesting for some of your students. It really is talking about the biology and activities of, of fungi, and it's written in a very popular style. So you might want to turn to that. Okay, so uh, here's the start of this. Uh, this is the genus Pulvinula. That's not something you or your students need to remember. Uh, this is an ascomycete. It's one of these fungi that I work on, and uh, you'll see some details of some of these structures later on. So for now, you don't really need to know much about this fungus, but I just ask you to look at this. This is a slide that was sent to me along with some specimens from Spain by Ricardo Galan, who was collecting and looking at this. Now, with your eye, trained as it is, you would look at this and say, how many species are there? I'm telling you these are all the same genus. They all belong to the same group. And just looking at them. Well, at least three. One white one up here, light-colored one, this orangey thing here. 
These are pink. This is kind of in between, can't be quite sure, but looks like at least three of these. And his question to me was uh, the logical one. I, I had worked on this in the past. So are these all the same? A good question. Yeah. We have ways of, of solving that question right now. And I'll, I'm, hmm? But now with the slide of it. Oh, I had specimens too. I was able to look at them and study them. Uh, of course, when they're dried, it's, the color's gone. I mean, we dry specimens to preserve them. So we're not getting all of the, the details necessarily. But his was a, an observation from the field. Here these are. They're about half a, or five millimeters or so um, and on soil. And his observation was, oh, I've picked these up. So how many of them are there? How many are here? Are these different species? Have they been described? And he sent it to me because I had, uh, before you were born, in 1976, I had <laughs> done a, <laughs> I, I, I talked to undergraduates a lot too. <laughs> uh, and they laugh at this, they really think it's funny. Uh, but uh, so, I, I had done a, a little monograph. I'd worked on these. I'd studied the morphology. I'd looked at the, the sizes, the spore shape, the habitats, all sorts of characters. I, and I did that because it was so difficult to identify these, and I thought this was a, a good way to get tenure. No. Um, <laughs> so I, in that work, I recognized 16 species. So I sorted through lots of things, lots of names, lots of descriptions and what really belonged in Pulvinula with the, as much as I could bring together at that point were these 16 species and there were some other names and those got discarded and put in other places. So we had 16. And then uh, since 1976 about nine have been described, nine more. And yet, uh, every time somebody like Ricardo sends me uh, a specimen, I think, oh, I'm not sure I've ever seen this before. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I get it because I'm the one that worked on it 30 years ago, but it still, uh, everything seems different. Every one of them seems to be different. And this can lead us to a question. So uh, how would I know when I was doing a monograph or doing one of these, uh, when I was done, you know, is there any way to know how well I had uh, mastered any of this? Some of you are saying no, and it's very difficult, but th we, we could play around with this a little bit. How do you know when you're done? And so what I played around with this was to uh, begin with what we are estimating and thinking about with the numbers of fungi, the total number of fungi. So uh, if we go through the various indexing guides and so forth, uh, we can come up with a number. It's about 75,000, give or take a couple thousand, uh, of species of fungi that we could know and hope to pick up and identify again. That is collected more than once, have good descriptions, have ways that we can retrieve information about it. And I've uh, footnoted this here. There, there are lots more names. There are about 320,000 names given to fungi. But for most of those, we have a single report and a faulty description. So it may be one line of description, red with white specks. That may be it. So we have lots of names. We have very little information that goes along with those names. So the real verified piece of this, about 75,000, uh, species. Uh, new discoveries come along at a, at a high rate, uh, 800 to 1,000 a year, and these are all cataloged and indexed. Now if you compare that to some other groups, uh, you're going to hear about mammals, or have heard, um, they will next. next time. So uh, you can ask the question of Hopi, so how many new mammals are described every year? And uh, the number is going to be you know, a handful, if that. It's a very low number. Birds, one a year, something like that. So here we're dealing with really a, 
an order of magnitude in terms of just this information about new things coming out. Uh, and the most widely quoted figure that we can come up with, which is an estimate, how many fungi are there, is about a million and a half. So 75,000 described, and these estimates that are based on various things uh, having to do with fungal biology. So uh, do you happen to know how many uh, flowering plants there are described or estimated? No? It's about 250,000. So you can begin, uh, and some people would push that to 300 or 350. And so one way to begin, uh, because you know that fungi are interacting with plants in various ways, one way to begin thinking about how these estimates could come about is to say, so uh, 250,000 plants, if each plant has some fungus that's uniquely associated with it, you'd already be at 250,000. So that's easy. Uh, part of this estimate is to take an area that is very well known, like uh, the British Isles, and look at the described fungi from the British Isles, and then begin to take areas and uh, species numbers and expand that to a worldwide basis. Uh, and as we did animals, you could do plants and think about if there are these many animals, what might we be able to say about the number of fungi? Many of them you'll hear about later. Uh, parasitic on insects, huge number of insects. What does that mean for the number of fungi? So uh, this number of 1.5 million is uh, pretty well accepted. It's argued about a little bit, but pretty well accepted is within some reasonable range. Uh, and so if 1.5 is the correct number, and we say that we know something about 75,000, means that 95% of the fungi aren't described, aren't known. So if we're looking for a, a deep hole, you know, there, there aren't enough of me to uh, begin to consider 95% of the, of the fungi not being known and needing to be described. And I'll point out that these 75,000, uh, that number, uh, really represents about 250 years of work. So in 250 years, if we begin with Linnaeus 1753, which is kind of the jumping off point, uh, in that time we've got 5% uh, of the known fungi accounted for. So pretty bad record, pretty daunting future. All right, so these estimates, I, I know that some of you are doubtful about a million and a half fungi, but uh, let me just point out that other people doubted it too in various ways that uh, one of the first estimates, 1943, estimated only 100,000. Now, we'd feel a lot better about 75,000 if that were correct, but we don't think it is. Uh, by 1951, it had more than doubled, 250,000. So people, again, using various metrics but trying to come up with it. This 1991 figure of 1.5 million is by David Hawksworth, and he's iterated and reiterated this, uh, this count and so forth. And uh, there is an estimate from 1992, slightly lower, a million, so even that doesn't make me feel a lot better if I believe it. So uh, there are just some... Uh, footnotes here, uh, between 1981 and uh, 1990, so about 16,000 new species described. And uh, the interesting thing about that is that 51% are from temperate regions. Now, that, that's showing a real bias. It shows where we all live. It shows uh, the a kind of activity uh, around these temperate regions. And if we switch then, and there's only one good study that I found about tropical re regions, but uh, if we look at tropical regions, uh, 15 to 25 percent of these surveys that are, are done find undescribed species, and those are mostly short-term surveys. So you go for a couple weeks and you collect and then you work through the materials and uh, 10 to 25 percent, or 15 to 25 percent, depending on where you are in the world, turn out to be undescribed. Uh, but in some of these longer range studies, the number is quite daunting, 60 to 80 percent. 
uh, undescribed. So the longer you're there, the longer you look, the more you find. Um, and uh, fungi to plants, I mentioned, but the estimate here would be three, point, uh, three to four to one. That is fungi to plants. Okay, now we did circulate this uh, paper, and I, I think it's interesting because it's one of the few long-term studies that have been done that looks at biodiversity, and you, you've had a chance to look at this a bit, and so I, I just point out a few of the things that we can discover from long-term studies like this. Uh, they're rare. There aren't that many of them around, so we don't have a lot to compare it to. Uh, this one is in Switzerland, a very well-collected and well-known uh, area biologically. So uh, the total number here that were recognized, uh, 408 species recorded over this 21-year period. And only eight species were found every year. Pretty amazing. So if you were doing a one-year study, or you did a couple one-year studies, you'd find eight of them. That, that's predictable. And of those, uh, six of them are mycorrhizal. Do you know what mycorrhizal fungi are? These are the ones that are associated in a beneficial way with the roots of plants. Okay, so here's a kind of pattern. You, you look and you look and you look, and the predictability among those 400 plus species is uh, pretty low, eight that you'd expect to find every year. Uh, year by year uh, accounts vary uh, amazingly, and you know why that is. You know, a year that's uh, dry or cold or not so good, there won't be so many. But uh, those numbers are, are pretty amazing. 18, but in uh, 2000, uh, or 1992, I, it was 191, so there is quite a, a difference here. Again, if we are thinking of snapshots, which is how many surveys are done, here's a little snapshot, one year, one time, one place, you get very different <coughs> results. You look at things very differently versus long-term studies. Uh, who predominates here? Well, mycorrhizal, this is a forest system, and these mycorrhizal uh, fungi seem to predominate. There are more of those. There are stable relationships in some way that come along there. I, and what's frightening, perhaps, or uh, gratifying, is that uh, we're following along on this species accumulation curve here. We're up to 408 or whatever it is. But it doesn't show any signs of tapering off. So it means as you keep going, there's more and more and more that uh, is going to turn up. And that can be for several reasons. One, that uh, we just haven't seen these ones that fruit very rarely. It's also true that within that forest, within that system that's being sampled, that ecosystem is changing at the same time. So we get different amounts of downed wood. We get different types of plants in and out. So the, the system itself is dynamic. Uh, Can I ask a question? Sure. I'm sorry. I just have a few. Saprotroph? Saprotroph. Uh, uh, living on dead organic material. OK, thank you. Um, then the other thing is, so that third line out of 408 species recorded, eight species were found every year in six, those were like rabbit. Yeah. Uh, so, you only found eight species every single year for that 21 years? Right. That was similar, correct? Eight species every year right. for 21 years. Wait, oh, that's it. Wait. The eight that were common to every year. Right, we're common. So yeah. then my next question is, uh, you said the number of mycorrhizal species were roughly twice that of the Seven other types. Uh, so, so, I mean, I'm just thinking of, the fungi interacting with the plants, and you would imagine that the fungi and the plant interaction is pretty specific in that you'd only have one type of fungus with one type of plant, but that's not the case. That's not right? the case. And then compounding that, is it possible that you could have multiple mycorrhizal populations with the same plant, and that they're just, uh, they're just fruiting at different year intervals depending on or, environmental or factors? Environment, yes. And in fact, as roots grow through the soil, there is this kind of succession on the, the root tips of the mycorrhizal fungi. Okay. Now, 
Yeah. Okay. Um, but so this idea that you can go back and, and uh, look at uh, uh, those records, think about years of high productivity, and in those years of high productivity, you tend to find rarer things fruiting and so forth. But this is all uh, what we wouldn't have if we did the, just these little one-year snapshots, which is often what we do. Now, I want to take you back to Polvinula. So uh, if 95% of the fungi are undescribed, and if there's something that uh, you know, I can assume about Polvinula and say, oh, it's not so different than any other fungus that we might have, and there are 22 species described, then uh, we can do some math, and 5% of the, uh, the total number of pulvinulas would be 22. That's what we know. And so we can extrapolate. And uh, so if I were going to get done and use those extrapolations, uh, I might expect that there would be 440 species of pulvinula. That is, if I'd already done 5% of the work. Now, is that real? Uh, who knows? You, you saw that photograph there. You, you know that uh, there's a lot of variation even within these that are closely associated. And anybody that I would tell this to, any of my colleagues that I would say, you know, I think there are 440 pulvinulas and I'm going to work the rest of my life to get those 440 <laughs> pulvinulas, which would be a great project. I am not going to do it, but it would be a really great project to try to uh, demonstrate whether, whether that was right. But they say, oh, come on, it's far too many. That can't be right. So uh, we can play around with this in a different way. Um, you know, maybe 40 would be okay order of magnitudes here, so what? So 40, I might be able to finish that. And if we were to play that out the other way, so if there were 40, how many uh, species of fungi would there be if there's something special or not so special about pulvinula? And we'd have uh, 130 plus thousand fungi, and we know that isn't right either. And it, this isn't really telling us much, uh, in, in this case, uh, other than we can make these assumptions, but we really need some real practical uh, data to back it up. That is, can, can if, if I were to begin on something like pulvinula, I wouldn't do it with pulvinula. I'd find something that was a little more common, but you could probably find some fungus that you could work on this and really begin to test whether this, uh, seven, uh, this five percent versus 95 undescribed holds up. So we could try that. And in a way, though he didn't mean to do this in this way, uh, a Dutch mycologist here uh, worked just in Europe on this uh, mushroom uh, here, uh, Pseudobiospora. Prior to 1995, uh, when he began the work, uh, only two species known in Europe. And so now, careful, and this is all morphological work, taking the things, looking at spores, looking at uh, other characters. Uh, in this monograph here, uh, in 2002, he recognized 13 to 15 species. So here's a big increase in, in what our knowledge of diversity uh, really meant. And this is a result of just this detailed analysis of uh, the morphology, looking at them, trying to see physical differences here. No molecules involved, nothing but looking carefully. So we can spin this a little bit and think about it. Uh, if we make that estimation of 90% described or not described, uh, then at least we're pushing half a million, a little bit more than half a million. And this, again, is just Europe. So if we took this genus and looked all around the world, took in North America, we might well be approaching a number that would make some sense. What type of differences genomically is that? Uh, we don't have data on this that I know of. I'm going to show you some examples with, uh, with sequence data. It's micro and it's just morphological. They're just making differences. I well, I guess trying to look at something morphological, we need to look at people morphologically too, and we look. Different. Yeah.
right? That's the pulvinula question, you know, is, is uh, a complexion with pulvinula worth species notation? And you'd want to correlate it with other, other kinds of data. And I, I, as I say, I have some in a second here that you'll be able to look and see. This is just kind of getting to the idea of what we don't know, and we don't know a lot. Whether it's 50% or 95%, there's still a lot of unknown, undescribed fungi. And why is that? Well, little comprehensive collecting worldwide, and certainly uh, not the kind of collecting and study that carries us over uh, long periods in a single area to look at changes over time. Mit misjudged morphology and anatomy, that is, oh, I don't think spore size makes any difference, so I'm not going to pay any attention to it. But in fact, it might, and these kinds of variations would be important. Or with that pulvinula, maybe those spore color, those colors that you see are significant. Maybe there are four species on that slide. It's a different kind of question. It's an interesting kind of question to talk about. How do you get all these species of the same genus living in the same spot at the same time? Uh, undetected genetic variation, and that gets back to this question of, of genomically, what are these like and what can we tell uh, now that we have uh, ways of looking at sequence data and analyzing sequence data, what does it tell us? So it may tell us that we have uh, lots of lineages that we don't recognize because their morphology is all very similar. Uh, the obvious, there are too few of us working on too many organisms. You know, we're just not able to dig in in the way that we might. And uh, there may be some uh, other things having to do with habitats and where organisms live. That is that uh, we, we may have a range of, of distinct lineages Within a, a species, uh, within a genus, uh, living in slightly different spots and associating slightly differently, and we just don't know that and haven't paid attention. Okay, so I want to give you a molecular example from work done in our lab, and you may know some of these fungi if you ever go out and look in the woods. Leotia is the name of the genus. A common name is often jelly babies, because they're gelatinous. They have a stalk and a cap portion. These are ascomycota. They're not mushrooms. They're in a different group. Spores are produced on the uh, upper surface of this cap. Now, I, there, it, it really was a very simple taxonomy here in the olden days. There was one that was all green, one that was all yellow. <laughs> Tell me the third. <laughs> green and yellow. <laughs> OK, so three species uh, segregated basically on color. And as we began to look at this, we thought, hmm, there seems to be a lot of, you know, you look at this one, what color is, is that yellow or is that kind of merging into muddy green? You know, what, what's going on here? What is the distinction? And so a graduate student, uh, Jerhong Zhang, uh, did a molecular analysis. And, and what this means, you know, you uh, choose some gene um, regions, and uh, she used a, a protein coding gene, RPB2, plus ITS, the uh, kind of barcode almost for certain fungi. I uh, put these together. I don't want to go into the, the detail here, but I want you to see what happens when you begin to look at what seem to be very simple. And it's not very simple anymore. So uh, here's, our, here's our group. And uh, this is one of the all green ones. And in our study, here, here's a couple of them. This is Canada and China are the geographical ranges here. And this tells us that these two group together. They, they are different. They're not identical. They're different, uh, widely geographically dispersed. 
Uh, in looking at this, it made us go back and say, hmm, why, why is that one coming off by itself? What, what's special about that? So we went back and re-examined morphology. And this one lacks uh, gelatinous tissue in the stipe. So it's a jelly baby, but only partly jelly. It's not completely gelatinized, which the rest of them are. OK, well, that, that, that one's fine. There's one. And if we look at the rest, uh, we uh, see that uh, these are segregating in various ways. And I'll just point out some of the geography, because I think this is so interesting when we begin to think about this. Now, these are producing spores that are able to fly through the air. Uh, we uh, used to say that fungi could go everywhere in the world. They're air dispersed. They just get around. These days, we say, oh, they don't do that as much as we thought. And we can tell that by looking at populations around the world. Uh, but if we look here, this whole group, there's just very little variation. These numbers are showing a uh, number of uh, changes in uh, nucleotide changes. So there's just almost no change, no difference among those. And if we look at the geography here, China, England, England, China, 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 Norway. You know, we at least have half the world represented here. Uh, and this follows in some of the other groups. Here's a real nice New England group, Massachusetts, Vermont. Ah, Virginia's in there. Too bad. But, uh, you know, the, the, the geographical part of it is not, uh, isn't segregating particularly. Uh, and so what she discovered, or what we think is the case, is that uh, these pigment differences, yes, they're important, but they're important in two ways. One, how they look when you collect them and pick them up in the field, and then what happens to them as they dry, as you preserve them. And often we're dealing with preserved specimens. So in some of them, uh, these are the fresh colors, uh, so they're green and yellow. Viscosa here, viscosa is this one that's green and yellow. You can see it's kind of nested in with everything else. It doesn't show up, but this viscosa group uh, dries and it stays green and yellow. But so does one group of lubrica, which is yellow to begin with, but then when it dries, it looks like that. Uh, here's one group that comes all green when it dries. I, I, so we, we kind of left it here. We didn't describe each of these, but if we're looking at diversity here and thinking about how many species, we began with three, and we might end up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, maybe. So we could increase the threefold by naming each of those clades and each of those groups. Now, we could sample some more, too. We could keep at, at this and keep putting them in. We have no South American examples in here, for example. So we could keep this up. And, and this might be a good test case to see how many, uh, whether we could ever hit a number that looked like it should, should be real. OK, so that's using molecules. And we use molecules in various ways. A big part of what we're, we do in the lab these days is to look at molecular phylo phylogenies and try to understand the relationship and the evolution of some of these groups. OK, so I want you to step back for a moment. And uh, we'll take a kind of different view, a different way of thinking about biodiversity. And uh, this is based on work by Roland Thaxter. Roland Thaxter was a Harvard biologist. Uh, finished his degree in 1889, uh, died in 1932. I'll give you some of these statistics. That those aren't so important. But it's one of the few cases where uh, the diversity of a single uh, of a single group was almost completely documented by a single individual. So he worked his whole career on this uh, odd group, Labul Benielis, and I'll tell you a little bit about those in just a second. I, I always preface things with Roland Thaxter. Um, I think he was a very prickly guy in many ways. 
but he was really something else. He uh, saw through problems. He uh, was instrumental in, in many breakthroughs in biology. And this has to do with the potato scab. Uh, potato scab is caused by a, a, a bacterium. And the demonstration that a, an organism causes a disease is, uh, goes through a series of processes. You know Koch's postulates. You know, you isolate, inoculate, isolate, and so forth. And what he did as uh, early in his career when he was at the Connecticut Experiment Station was that he solved what was the causal agent of potato scab. And he did that by isolating, growing the organism, then reinfecting and going through this, these, looking for the symptoms and so forth. And uh, he published this illustration that shows the potato scab. And you can tell what he did. He uh, put his initials in when he inoculated it, R, T, so there was ego too. But uh, he uh, did this inoculation and then when the disease manifests itself, you get this pattern and you get the pattern of, of his initials, his monogram here. Uh, so you'll see that he uses that in some other ways too. So what are these? These are insect parasites, and they're insect parasites that don't uh, do a lot of damage to the insect. So we're not looking at organisms here that could be used for biological control. They seem to be in populations of insects at some fairly high levels in some cases, but they don't kill the uh, organism outright. Uh, and this is the entire fungus. That's it. Now, you're used to thinking about fungi with these creepy uh, filaments and so forth. Uh, indeterminate growth, that is, I can begin the fungus up here and it'll reach Jack before long as it creeps along. That's indeterminate growth. But uh, these label benialis uh, have a regular form, a regular uh, set of patterns of cell division so that you get these amazing looking structures. Now, I, I always thought they looked like birds or something, but you have to shrink them way down. They're like hairs on the outside of an insect, so they're on the exoskeleton. This is a little holdfast cell here. It penetrates and, and the nutrition for the fungus is derived from the uh, body fluids of the insect. But here it is, and it's a set number of cells. And this species will always have that same set number of cells. It's a pattern. It's a genetically controlled. Uh, they produce spores, and the spores are produced here within this structure. And within this structure are the other uh, structures called assi. This is an ascomycete. And here are the ascospores. They're two-celled uh, spores. They're oozed out this tip, and they get transferred to other insects through contact, body contact. So they get passed around. So they're very special in their development. They're very special in the way that they uh, control their parasitism. They're not killing the organisms. They're using it. Uh, they're on a variety of different kinds of insects. There's a whole lot of arguments about their specificity and so forth. And these are uh, fungi that are unculturable. You can't grow them up in a petri plate. So you're kind of stuck with what you've got from field collections. But so what did Thaxter do? What about Thaxter? Um, really uh, spanned two centuries, the late 19th, early 20th century. He's been called the uh, best mycologist or the most outstanding mycologist of the 20th century. Uh, Harvard College graduate, went to medical school, saw the light, uh, took time off, uh, went back to the uh, graduate school here, worked with William G. Farlow, who was uh, on the faculty here, uh, was one of the first PhD students in the newly founded Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, worked at Connecticut, that's where he did all this practical stuff uh, with potatoes and so forth. Came back to Harvard in 1891 and stayed here. That, that was his uh, career. 
Uh, he came from a family with a famous mother, and I point this out to you all in New England here, Celia Thaxter, poet of the Isles of Shoals, uh, had a garden, uh, part of the, uh, a salon, famous people coming through uh, Appledore Island where the hotel was. Cornell has a field station out in at Star Island uh, in, on the Isles of Shoals. Uh, but this is his mother in the garden at Appledore, uh, a famous painting, Child Hassam, the, the American uh, Impressionist involved here. And uh, sad soul, take comfort, not forget that sunrise never failed us yet. You can take the poetry or not. She was influential in various ways. But this is the, the family that uh, he came from, and we see in his writings some of the things that came back and forth. Here he is, as a boy, trained as a naturalist from the day he could walk, it seems like. Uh, here they are out shooting birds, and I, I put this in, you know, you, you deal with kids and you deal with your own kids, and I thought about my two daughters who always uh, had disagreements when I read this from his father here, his diary. The boys had their guns, <coughs> uh, and popped away at what few little beach birds uh, were there. They fire both together at, this, at, at two and kill one, at two birds and kill one. Who did and did not miss remains a problem. You can imagine the scrapping. Um, the bird uh, was, I think, a variety of plover. plover. Uh, I skinned it after we got home and put it to dry on the mantelpiece. So again, growing up with natural history with this all around him. So uh, what did he do with this group? Uh, when he started in the 1890s, uh, he, uh, there were six described genera within this order, Labu Benielis, 15 species, one from North America, two from South America, and 12 from Europe. And that's a kind of distribution that you might have expected to see late in the 19th century. Where, where was the action? The action was with these European um, botanists. I, here, these are some others of them. These are two of them. So the hold fast here, this stalk, spores up here. In his uh, first uh, monograph, in the, the first volume, 1895, he did five volumes of this monograph. The labor and time involved in an, obtaining and studying the several thousand specimens which have been examined in the preparation of this paper and of the accompanying plates can hardly be appreciated by anyone who has not personally experienced, has, has not had personal experience of the many difficulties associated with the manipulation and study of these, for the most part, very minute plants. We thought fungi were plants then. Okay, so kind of literary piece there, and you notice that uh, that was one sentence. <laughs> Don't let your students do this. And this is uh, further on, uh, one sentence. Uh, it is therefore needless to say that my investigations carried out on as they have been in connection with other occupations. He was teaching, he was doing all this other stuff. Uh, are incomplete and unsatisfactory in many points relating to the structure and development of certain genera for the proper study of which sufficient time or material or both have not been available and although a certain amount has been done in connection with the nuclear changes which take place in the sexual organs before and after fertilization, I have been unable as yet to reach uh, conclusions concerning them sufficiently definite to warrant their publication. Okay, so he's kind of telling us two parts of this. He's been out in the field, he's been collecting, he's been doing things. It's uh, overwhelming, this dissection of little things to put them on microscope slides and be able to study them. And he's been a busy man. He's had a lot of other things that he's had to do. He worked on other fungi as well. So that's one sentence, and it's 94 words. And uh, his papers are full of these, and they're wonderful. And it speaks to his kind of literary construction of all of this. 
So this idea of collecting and going out and, and uh, finding these, he's a good example for us to think about there. He spent his childhood in Florida and Jamaica shooting birds with his father. Uh, field trips to Newfoundland to various parts of North America. Florida, you know, when you think of Florida, we're thinking of Miami Beach and the high rises. Uh, 1890s Florida, the railroad had just gotten there. It was really pretty much wilderness. Um, Europe, Berlin, uh, New Hampshire, South America, we have a wonderful diary from 1905, six. He spent almost a year, Granada, Trinidad. And what he was doing was collecting insects. The way you find these fungi is that you, you collect the insects and uh, you figure out a way to get a lot of insects together so you can screen them all. And uh, you also realize that the incidence of infection is pretty low. So uh, it may be 10%. So 10 out of 100 insects that you look at may have the fungus present. So we still are amazed at how he did that. And we can't tell whether he had some kind of super duper uh, eye, you know, so he didn't have to use a microscope or something, that he could just screen every insect. We, we don't really know how he did it, but uh, most of us haven't even found any of these before. And uh, he had a summer place at Kittery Point in Maine, and for 50 years he collected in that same spot. And one of the things that I'm trying to think about is how can I use this Kittery Point 50 years of collection and specimen deposit in some way to begin to talk about these diversity issues. And I haven't quite addressed how to do that because there are an awful lot of collections there. But he went out, he found them, he worked on them that way. So he worked 40 years on these. He described 103 genera and 1,260 species. So he went from a handful to 1,000 two handfuls, 15 species to uh, 1,200 spe species. A five volume monograph that was uh, published every, every few years, a volume, he treated 128 genera, that is he didn't even describe all of the genera that were being treated, and all in all about 1,300 species. So here's a lifetime devoted to uh, looking at and trying to document uh, the diversity here. And he made drawings uh, for each of these. And so it's about uh, three and a half thousand drawings that he made, which were assembled in 166 plates. And when I say drawings, I mean really superhuman drawings. And I'll, I'll uh, talk to you about, I'll show you some of those in a second. The last volume, the fifth one, came out uh, the year before he died. The fifth contribution to the taxonomy of the Labo Benielis was intended to complete the series by including all the forms published or assembled since the appearance of parts one and two. It has become so unwieldy, it was 435 pages, however, that in order to be published at all, it has been necessary to shorten the text, excluding the large genus Labo Benia and to reduce the number of figures. Although 1136 of the latter are given in the accompanying plates, there were 60 in that volume, the number might well have been twice as great without danger of superfluous illustration. Uh, his sentence is shorter, I think he's tireder. <laughs> And he's beginning to look at this of, you know, you know, I could just keep going for the rest of my life on this, and he basically did. Uh, these plates are uh, interesting to behold. The monograph is this size. It's a kind of half folio. Uh, and each of these is, uh, was done as, with a camera lucida. Do you know? Does anybody use camera lucidas anymore? I don't know if people still use yeah. them. <laughs> you know what they are. Do you know what they are? Yeah. No. Uh, you uh, hook onto your microscope a device with a prism, and the prism splits the, the light that comes through. And part of that light goes to your eye, and part is deflected to a mirror beside the microscope on a, an arm, 
And that mirror then allows you to see your hand and at the same time see what you're seeing through the microscope. So looking through the microscope, you can trace what you're seeing. All biology students used to do this. You can trace and then have a representation of the outline and other details. So uh, he would make a camera lucida sketch with a pencil and then he'd fill in some details and he'd blacken the back of this sketch which was on thin paper uh, with pencil with graphite and then he'd use it like carbon paper and put it down on a big plate, put it here in the corner and then he'd trace this so he'd have the outline and the details and then he would use India ink and uh, assemble the, uh, do the whole drawing. And you don't get a good idea of it here, but these are all stipples, individual dots. And uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, I saw these monographs. I was not here, I was at Cornell, and I kept thinking, wow, you know, I do my own illustrations too, but he had a superhuman hand. You know, how could you get those dots so perfectly arranged? And if you look at the originals, and you're certainly welcome to come over sometime to the Farlow Library and we can look at them. But if you look at these, uh, you realize that I was, I, and I, I thought superhuman hand, but then I thought, no, he's doing it like I did it, which was I'd make it very big and then I'd reduce it make it small so that my mistakes got smaller at the same time. You know, it was a good way to make this perfect looking thing. But then I got here and I looked at the originals and I thought, hmm, they're all the same size. They are reduced to only a little bit. So it's not a superhuman, it is a superhuman hand. He really did each dot and get them in the right place. It's just an amazing thing. But so uh, he did, you know, hundreds of these thousands of these drawings. Each species came to be illustrated with these. And again, this just points out a little, little bit of what you're doing. Again, this is the whole fungus. There isn't anything else. The insect is out here. It's attached to the exoskeleton. Here are these uh, cells dividing in a particular way. Here's the parathesium, the structure with the assay inside, and here are the ascospores. Here's a different one. Okay. So fantastic organisms, but also just a fantastic focus that he was able to put on this. Uh, there he is. There he is. This is in the early 30s. And uh, these are charts that he made for teaching up on the walls behind. And this one looks like it's sprouting from his neck, but he does not have a cordyceps from his neck. <laughs> So where are we today? Well, uh, we have about five families, 140 genera, not a whole lot more, 20 or so over what he had dealt with and described uh, in his last volume. There are about 2,000 species. So here it is, kind of one person, one group, doggedly going through this, out in the field, collecting, doing the microscopy, doing the illustration, presenting this this whole picture. And uh, he would have probably died an earlier death had he seen Ed Wilson's uh, comment here. Two billion beetles, the Labo Benielis love beetles, so two, billion, two million beetles in the world. Again, this is this, one of these extrapolations of how many organisms there are. And a billion, billion insects are alive at any given time around the world. Now, that, that would be a sure formula to drive you over the edge if you were looking at these pathogens. You know, what am I ever going to do and when, when will I stop? I don't know, you know, but uh, he, here it is. And it's, it's just a good example of, of what it takes in some of these uh, biodiversity type scenarios. Now, we'll switch gears a little bit uh, back to the lab and thinking about things that we've done and uh, pointing out that uh, sometimes we recognize diversity, but we don't know a whole lot of what to do about it. Uh, do you know the plant Mediola virginica? It's the Indian cucumber. Uh, it's in the lily family. 
It's common in the woods around here, and you recognize it because uh, it, well, sometimes is, it's quite a range of size. But it has two whorls of leaves, and at the top there's some flowers, uh, these lily-type flowers. And it gets its name Indian cucumber because if you uh, dig up the rhizome, it's kind of a fleshy, uh, carbohydrate-rich uh, structure. Uh, this has a pathogen, and uh, the pathogen was named by Roland Thaxter as Mediolaria farloi. And this is Thaxter's drawing of it. And I point out again, here's a monogram. Uh, this is a man not without ego. You know, he's uh, showing us here. So it's RT, and if you can see this up close, those are insect legs. And it says DEL, DEL for delineator, drawer. So here's what he illustrated, and here's what it looks like in the, the field. Uh, these plants, the, the whirls are reduced, so you uh, don't have two whirls, they're kind of down together. And you get this swelling here, here uh, at the base. And if you section that and look through it, you find assai, these uh, structures with spores inside. Uh, the ascospores are dark colored, you see some of them here. This is a cross-section through this. So here's just this layer of assay. Now, uh, my history with this goes back to, uh, what, 1970 probably, when my professor at Cornell decided that we really needed to solve the problem of what this fungus was. So uh, we went back to the literature. It had only been reported and discussed by Thaxter in 1922, I think, when he described it. And he described it from several locations in New England. Uh, Magnolia, Mass, up on the North Shore. Kittery Point, Maine, of course, where Thaxter lived. Chicoroa, New Hampshire. That's where Farlow had a summer home. So three, three locations. And in 1970, then, we did all this research and figured out where Farlow lived in uh, uh, 1915 or whenever this was. We went up to New Hampshire. We collected it again. Now, this plant is very widespread. It's all through eastern North America. It goes down to Virginia. It goes west into Michigan, north pretty far. Uh, we look and look on the populations everywhere. It's just not there. I found two more locations, one near Chikoroa uh, in the 80s and one uh, Mount Monadnock. Those are known, and these are from Mount Monadnock. So uh, new techniques are available now. Nobody knew where to place this. Nobody knew other than that it was an ascomycete. So what's it related to? What's it uh, involved with? Uh, so we did some molecular phylogeny here, and this, uh, you don't need to know anything here except look at the arrows, and here's where mediola, mediolaria, farloe comes out. And what this is really telling us is that it doesn't come out convincingly with anything much. Uh, this is a consensus tree. It's all unresolved, basically. So here we are uh, in the early part of the 20th century. We begin to look at this and we think we still don't know who's its closest relative, really. We, we have no definitive uh, answers there. So we went another step and decided, all right, we know this big group that it's associated with. We know the, a, a large group here. So what can we say about that in terms of how the sampling has been done for molecular studies? You know, we talk about morphological studies and sampling and looking. We can analyze in various ways. But uh, here's what we know. And again, you don't really need to know anything about these. These are these uh, possible relatives of medial area. And uh, the dark lines show us what has been sampled in genomically uh, to look at DNA samples. And the white parts are, uh, except, uh, these are genera, uh, accepted genera where there has been no sample. So we can sequence as much as we want, but if we don't have anything to match it to, it doesn't help us. 
And what we see here is that there's an awful lot of white bars. And that tells us that sampling just has not been uh, complete within these groups. And as sampling improves, maybe we'll be able to fit medial area and any, other, any number of other fungi into a phylogeny and understand its relationships. But back to diversity and thinking about this, uh, you know, these are known fungi. This is part of the 75,000. But what we know about them, what we don't know is anything about their, uh, their DNA, their sequences. So even where we know fungi, we still don't have data that helps us with many of these projects. All right. Uh, little divergence in a different way to think about it. Uh, these are lupin, and they're not lupin from New England. They're lupin from Iceland. And why do I put this in here? Uh, part of it is to remind us that plants from around the world, their fungus associates, uh, fungi on their own, uh, get introduced into areas where they didn't previously exist. And if there's an overall kind of theme to thinking about uh, diversity and biodiversity in the world, part of that theme is that more and more our ecosystems are becoming homogenous. That is, we're finding more and more of a kind of world flora or world fauna than local floras and faunas. And I point this out because the lupin was introduced into Iceland and it was introduced as a, a nitrogen fixer. It's in the uh, legume family, so it fixes nitrogen. Uh, Iceland is uh, a desolate looking place in many ways. So here's looking across one of the fjords and there, there, these lupins are all over here. You can't quite see it in the way that it's uh, showing here, but they've escaped. They're out and they're everywhere. So, uh, you know, if we're thinking about the fungal flora, the bacterial flora, any number of things, uh, it's different now than it once was. And Iceland is very different than it once was. Uh, I have a lecture that I give in my Trees and Forests course uh, using Iceland as an example of thinking about uh, changes induced by humans. And it's one of the few places in the world where we have about a thousand year history of human occupation because of the, the literature, because of the documentation. We know when first settlement took place. Uh, Iceland, a scene like this would have had uh, Birch and willow forests would have been forested. Uh, the forests didn't last long after people and grazing animals got there. Uh, the native flora was quite limited, about 500 species. I did field work in Iceland because I thought with that limited species, maybe we can try to figure out something about diversity that would be uh, a different approach, not going to the most diverse areas like the tropics, but something that was simplified. So uh, we, are, we are moving organisms around. We're uh, inducing all of these changes that uh, those organisms may, uh, may induce uh, and uh, affect. But we are uh, looking at a world that's quite different. And when we begin to look at the fungi and look at all of these associations, we have to take that into account. The other place that I've done field work and collected, and I point this out again in the context of thinking about uh, where you go and how you do this and what might be there, is uh, southern South America. This is near Punta Arenas in, in Chile. And uh, we went there because we had this wonderful diary from Roland Thaxter, 1905-6, in which he talks about the fungi that he finds. And many of the things that he found had still not been worked up and uh, have still not been worked up and resolved. So uh, Postdoc and I got some funding and went to Punta Arenas to look for these. And you know, one of the, the gratifying things is that despite mining and grazing and all sorts of other things that have happened there, that we were still able to find some of the same fungi that Roland Thaxter picked up 100 years before. But a beautiful place. So the take home messages here, uh, 
There's more diversity than we have accommodated. If nothing else, you've got that picture uh, with the fungi, with many other organisms as well. Uh, that it's not an easy task to understand diversity and to begin to document it. It means going to the field, understanding the organisms, understanding the ecology, a uh, variety of techniques, molecular techniques of kind of open doors in the way that we can look at some of these problems. And uh, we have to know something about the interactions and what those organisms are doing out in the field, and I often uh, step back, having worked in the field for a long time. When I studied pulvinula in 1976, I was perfectly happy to say, oh, it occurs on soil and it's probably a saprobe. It's probably saprophytic. And that's what we said. We know now that that's not true. It's mycorrhizal. It grows with, uh, associated with the roots of plants. It's a nice hint. It's a little bit more to think about in terms of what the diversity might look like. So, and then this is just the list of characters <coughs> involved here in a rainy day in Vermont. What are you holding? Well, uh, I'm holding a big mushroom, but it's supposed to look like one of these big cup fungi. <laughs> but it's a mushroom. Okay, any questions, anything? I've bored you enough. Thank you for the historical perspective. I mean, that's a, a nice treat. Um, I had a question because I'm not a mycologist, and it's really hard to deliver inspiration. I've tried to convert them from being doctors to mycologists because <laughs> I think it, there's a lot of opportunity. But in your experience, what would you recommend to us as ways to intrigue the students and get them excited about, besides hallucinogenic mushrooms, <laughs> something else? Are they still doing those? <laughs> they still draw them everywhere. Uh, well, I, I think there are a couple things. Uh, Tara and I talked a little bit about uh, how can you do surveys with organisms that are so elusive, and several of you mentioned that you'd seen lichens on the way in. I think there are many projects involving lichens that would be good to think about. And I say that I, I have studied lichens, but uh, it's partly that you need to have something that they can reliably go to and see and work with. And one of the difficulties is that these fungi are often ephemeral, and so it's, it's difficult to pick them up. But lichens and air pollution studies, uh, lichens are very sensitive to uh, air, polluted air, particularly SO2 in this area. And so you can begin to uh, have students look and uh, identify their some simple keys and uh, do some assessments of air quality. They can look at sources of pollution and see if there's any effect on, on uh, distribution of those lichens. They can look on single trees and, and work on those. Uh, they could also do some work with growth rates and so forth with lichens, which are very sm uh, slow. But, establishment and so forth could be done. So there's that. Uh, there's also uh, a lot of these predictable plant pathogens that uh, they could look at uh, as well. I, here on campus, I, I do, Tara mentioned the tree walk, but in the mycology course, I always take them out on the first day and walk around campus. And I've scouted it a little bit so that I know what I can find. but. Uh, you can almost always find the fungus on uh, rosaceous plants, the uh, gymnosporangium, uh, forming those yellow pustules. You can almost always find that all around on crab apples and so forth. And that's kind of hook. You know, here they are. They're around here. Uh, wood rot fungi, often there's persistent uh, conchs or brackets on those trees. So you can do uh, some things with those where they're persistent. So. I've got uh, those staked out. Uh, the mulch around buildings, often full of stuff, and if it's watered at all, uh, it will continue to sprout, including morels, the choice edibles of the springtime, mm -hmm. comes up around here on campus in the mulch. So I think that there are some ways to think about it, more, uh, more gardening than field, but uh, that, that's what I would do, I guess. Yep. 
good. There were others. You still you teach evenings at the extension school? Uh, I taught last term and uh, did the biology of trees and so forth. I haven't done a mycology course in extension for a while. Or in summer school. I prom I, I'll talk about summer school if you want to do that too, but I'm, I'm not teaching in summer school. Oh, I, was just, I was just looking at the future. Yeah. Every once in a while I do extension in one form or another. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of curiosities. Uh, Baxter, you said he was looking at this Labo Benialis. I mean, first, yeah. the name. What, what, what is that for? Oh, the, the name? Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. We, we always think that names are going to be descriptive sometime, somehow. And uh, that is descriptive, but it's named after a Frenchman, La Boule Benet. And, and with, with so many fungi, I guess that would be visible to see. I mean, how did he even come across these uh, insect parasites? Yeah, he began his, uh, it's an interesting kind of, uh, question because he began his PhD work looking at insect parasites and he did that because he began before that uh, working with insects and he his first paper was on moths or, or caterpillars and the moths that they became kind of doing life cycle studies with the Lepidoptera and he noticed in his rearing of these that he got fungi on some of these. So he, his grandiose view was that he was going to do a PhD thesis on insect parasites and he got started and realized that this is just not going to work at all. And he narrowed it down to a single group, which I didn't talk about, the Entomophthorales was his thesis. But then he, as he was collecting, he realized that there was all this diversity, not just within the lab of Benielis, but across the fungi of parasites. So it, it happened. Yeah. It happened. Yeah. yeah. So um, you mentioned the homogenization of habitats, and I think more about invasive plants or, right. or animals. Are there comparable stories from invasive fungi? Uh, well, yeah, you know, we often are bringing the fungi along with plants and animals, and so uh, certain, uh, certain types of diseases have come with their plants and so forth. Um, my colleague Ann Pringle has worked on uh, Amanita phalloides and Amanita phalloides, you know what Amanitas are, don't eat them, they're big, you know, they uh, have veils and they're deadly poisonous, or many of them are. And uh, what she began working on was the introduction of that species into California and uh, it's European, got introduced into California. It spread all through native habitats in California. Uh, has become a problem not because it's spread through, but because mushroom collectors didn't know what they were collecting and they were eating these deadly poisonous mushrooms. Uh, it's been introduced into parts of uh, eastern North America. It seems to behave differently in those different habitats, but that's one example of an introduced fungus that just takes over. There's another Amanita that you know about, Amanita muscaria, which is the fly agaric. It's the red, yellow, orange one that we see a lot around plantings here. That's gotten introduced into Australia, where it's just taken over. And part of the problem with these is that, or part of the question would be, so these are mycorrhizal. What happens with the native mycorrhizal species? So you have things that are on the eucalyptus in Australia, but in comes Amanita muscaria, does a very good job of making a home there. And are the fungi that used to be uh, mycorrhizal, are they outcompeted? Are they losing ground? And we don't know the answer to that completely, but there are some good examples of it. Uh, Elsa Valinga, that's a name that you'll ask me to spell and I'm going to have to think about it, but there is a paper about invasive fungi that she and a group have done. So in the paper that we read, they were, we were looking at the number of species that were inside of the forest plot and you were continually finding new species that were joining. However, at another point... Or occurring, lecture, or occurring. Were occurring. Yeah. At another point in the lecture you talked about that the distribution of the, we had a, at one time thought that the spores were 
flying all over the world and were traveling. That was how I was trying to, to understand that there was, was an mm -hmm. increase in species. Does that not occur? Well, it we? could be new introductions coming into that area, or it could be that fruiting, uh, that the fungus is always there. And a lot of these uh, studies using uh, sequence data with soil shows us that there's just loads of fungi that we never see fruiting. Mm -hmm. So they're there, they've colonized at some level, depending on how the environment goes, they may or may not fruit. Mm. Uh, one of the students uh, here was involved in the Harvard Yard Green Project. Do you know about the, you know, all the compost and looking at the soil and studying it? And uh, he did soil cores around the campus. One of the fungi that he turned up was a uh, tuber, a truffle. Mm -hmm. He turned up the sequence. Now, we've never seen the truffle, mm. but he turned up the sequence in the soil samples. So, someday, somewhere, <laughs> little do we know, there'll be a truffle. No, but we don't know when it's going to fruit or if it fruits or what the deal is. Okay. You know, you were just saying how it may fruit or not fruit, depending on the environment. How do you see that the global warming may? Well, I think we're seeing, t we'll see changes in, in uh, both distribution ranges as well as these fruiting patterns. We don't know which way or what will happen, but it's certainly one of the concerns that people might have. Especially, you know, if you begin to think about global warming, kind of these big migrations that some of the uh, projections would require, you know, moving 100 miles in 50 years or something like that. I, one could imagine that a plant could move, but maybe not its fungus, or, some, or the fungus move, but not have a host. So, you know, there, there are a lot of questions about this, I think. I was just thinking about how you said a lot of times the spores or whatever it is may be there, but never materialize, and if the circumstances change, Will they, in fact, take over everything else? Yeah, they could. They could. Displace everything else that's yeah. currently in. Often, I mean, when I talk about these soil bank situations where you've got a lot of things in the soil, some can be that there's spores or propagules that haven't germinated. Others are that the fungus is there and physiologically active, but not uh, fruiting. Two different things. Um, more basic to just about these particular organisms and classifying them with the asexual organism. Is, is it more morphological? What is a species? Are you assuming these are asexual? Well, both asexual. Some are and some aren't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But when you have that that diversity, when you're trying to figure out what, what is a species. Yeah. Well, we know. Yeah, th there are many definitions of species. I think mycologists have kind of fallen uh, into a, a group that are looking at phylogenetic species concepts um, versus biological species concepts because there's lots of interbreeding often. Uh, the question of sexual and asexual. Um, most fungi are capable of going through sexual reproduction, so recombination is happening. Uh, there are some fungi that we know from genetic information never or haven't recently reproduced sexually, that they are only reproducing asexually. Uh, fungi have a variety of breeding mechanisms so that not so that a species or a breeding group can be maintained because they'll only breed with something that's compatible. So there, there is a lot of genetic control over compatibility and breeding. I'm not sure that answers the species concept exactly. Uh, these days, I think uh, more than anything, we're looking at, at these pa phylogenetic patterns that we can do with sequence data and defining species with that and then going back and looking at morphology to see if there are any characters that agree. So it's kind of hybrid morpho species and uh, genetic. So is there a lot of renaming that happens as you start to reclassify things? Oh yeah, yeah. 
And the, I pointed out that there are 320,000 names, and some of those are resurrected every once in a while. You know, we learn something about them so they come along. But uh, if you're an amateur mycologist and out collecting fungi to eat, this renaming is one of the most difficult things that happens for people. That it's very hard to get over the old names and get on to the new names. Can you just speak a little about the, the mycorrhizals? Uh, you mentioned there's three to four fungi per, to, to, per plant. Can be, yeah. And, and those are all mycorrhizal, do you think? Or? Oh, well, they can be parasites as well. Uh, mycorrhizae come in two forms. Uh, there are those that colonize the outside of the root and penetrate between the cells of the roots. Those are the ectomycorrhizae. And forest trees, for example, have ectomycorrhizae, and those are ascomycetes and basidiomycetes uh, that are involved in those. Uh, a lot of herbaceous plants have a different type of mycorrhizae that are called endotrophic mycorrhizae, where individual cells are penetrated by the fungus, and there's no covering over the roots. And in both cases, the idea is that fungus hyphae can penetrate and get out into the soil much better than roots and root hairs. And so it really gives a lot more surface area. They also uh, differentially can pick up minerals and water and materials. So uh, it's a way of uh, kind of harvesting from the environment to the benefit of the plant. And the mycorrhizae you're gaining? Carbohydrates. Yeah, it's a, an autotroph and heterotroph hooked up. Um, and there's a, probably a gradient of what the exchanges are like and so forth. But uh, one of the things I always point out is that with these mycorrhizal plants, and almost all plants are mycorrhizal, what you see and look at and think about as normal growth and normal growth rate and so forth is because it's got the fungus there. If you take the fungus away, it's stunted. It doesn't grow at the same rates. So it's, it's an intimate part of how these plants get along. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering, you talked a lot about trying to find the fungi again. So is there a lot, is there success with like keeping them in the lab and learning about their growth and development that way? Because especially yeah. things like that lives on a fly in a certain area. I mean, how would you ever learn about its life cycle? Yeah, well, I took part of this out and I, I I've, got to leave at noontime, so uh, I want to make sure that uh, I talk about this. But uh, this is another piece of research that we did a couple years ago. Uh, this is a little cup fungus that's on a piece of dead wood. Uh, this is blown up a little bit. The one on the top is natural size. So these are little pinheads, practically, on the, the wood. And through a series of circumstances, I realized that I knew a whole lot more about this than I thought I did. I, uh, I turned up one of these, I, I should admit this, mycologists, and you should know it for your classes. One of the ways that you can really study a lot of fungal diversity is to bring dung samples into the lab, keep them in a moist chamber, and they, there'll be a succession of fungi, and it's wonderful to look at. They're just all, all different kinds of fungi. It doesn't smell too much at, after it gets going. Students will be yucky about it, but uh, you can get a, a very, very broad range of fungi that way, and I had done that, turned up a, one of these on a dung sample and began isolating it, isolating the uh, fungus and growing it in the lab these are all asexual spores. These are the uh, conidia of the fungus. So as I collected more and more and more of that particular fungus, I was finding all this range of diversity in these different conidial types. Uh, and what was most impressive about it is that some of these, like these, I recognized right away because they, are, uh, they trap nematodes. Again, your students should know this. It's a really wonderful thing to, you can get Carolina kits with uh, nematode trappers. So you grow the fungus. The fungus doesn't produce the traps unless the nematode is present. You put the nematodes in, forms these traps. The traps, I don't think I have any here. 
Uh, the traps come in several forms. Some of them are rings, and the rings are constricting. So the nematode puts its head in, got it, and then the fungus penetrates the nematode, uses the carbohydrates. Some of them form kind of three-dimensional rings, and so the fungus gets tangled up in the rings, and again, it's a goner. Once it's caught, the fungus penetrates and eats it up. Uh, but as I looked within this single family, I found all of this range of conidial types. These are aquatic, they float. Uh, these are aquatic, these are various kinds of things. So I, all of this was in the lab. I, it was in the field in the sense that I went out and picked up the fungus and then I uh, did the isolation and I found this great diversity. And uh, that just shows us that it's a single family there. It's a good, it will, this will be a good story someday. There's a German working on this uh, family. It's the Orbiliaceae. I think it had 35 species, and uh, when his monograph is published sometime this century, I guess, I, he's threatening 250 new species. So it's another example. But, you know, we can look at these and see all of these. I think I have arrows at some point. Uh, these tend to fall within particular clades, within particular groups, within the within this, and so uh, w this was all done in the lab and, and looking at these spores and these spore types in the lab. I don't know if that answers anything, but yes, you can do, you can do a lot in the lab.